Come on, bless the Lord. He is good and greatly to be, to be praised. Amen. Um, thank God for another day, another opportunity to gather and hear and worship and praise him. And to all of our leaders, deacons, first lady, ministers, and members, and to all of our guests, those watching online, it's, uh, it's a blessing and a privilege to be in the service one more one more time. Amen. Uh, turn with me, if you would, to uh, Psalm 24. Psalm 24. I'm going to start a series today. Uh, no more left, no more leftovers. Amen. No more leftovers. Psalm 24 and 1. When you get this, amen. The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. For he laid its foundation on the seas and established it on the rivers. Amen. Our God and our Father, Lord, how we thank you, God. We praise, we bless, we glorify you for you're so good. And you're greatly to be praised. And God, we thank you. God, we thank you for every gift. For every good and perfect gift comes from you, and we say thank you. God, thank you for another day's journey. Thank you for your gift of salvation. Thank you for strength. Pray now, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, Father, that you would stand up in this vessel of clay and teach us on today, that when we leave this place, our lives will be the better, our praise will be the greater, our faith the stronger. And God, we give you thanks and we give you praise. In Jesus' mighty name, we do pray. Amen. Look at your neighbor before you take a seat and say, neighbor, with the help of God, the Holy Spirit, and our prayers, our pastor is going to preach about the beginning of stewardship. Amen. You may take your seat. Ushers, please let those in who are in the hallways and keep all of those in who are trying to exit uh, to the hallway. Amen. Praise be to God. Oh, I could. Well, maybe just a bite. Wow. 
Well, how true that is. And you probably couldn't understand what the fellow was saying, car number one. But he said, dude, he brought the pie. He brought the pie to the party. And he gets none. How often do we spend all of our resources on everything else and give God what's left over if there's anything left over? To understand the beginning of stewardship, we have to understand that we are, first of all, not owners. We are stewards. We are managers of another's property. Genesis 1 and 1 says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Psalm 24 and 1 that we just read says, The earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. In Haggai, the prophet writes, The Lord says that the silver and gold is mine. The cattle upon a thousand hills belongs to the Lord. Not only the hills, but the cattle, the hills, and everything else, it all belongs to the Lord. Creation establishes ownership. God made the whole earth so it all belongs to him. He then put man in it and then he gave Adam and Eve their first job. He gave Adam his job to rule over the animals and to tend the garden. And as their salary or their compensation, Adam and Eve uh, could eat of anything in the garden except one tree. Like Adam and Eve, we have also been created by God. We have been made in his image. We have been given food by God. We have been given a place to live by God. Everything we think is ours, it all belongs to God. But anything that had, uh, they had really, Sam, didn't belong to them. And we, we see that when God puts them out of the garden because they didn't take anything with them. And the same thing, when we leave here, we will take nothing with us when we leave. Ecclesiastes chapter 5 verse 15 says, As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came, and shall take nothing of his labor which he may carry away in his hand. And then in Job, in one of the lowest points in his life, in Job chapter 1 verse 21, Job says, Naked came out of my mother's womb. And naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Everything we have has been given to us by the Lord. It is all borrowed. Tell your neighbor it's borrowed. Amen. Because it all belongs to God. So what is a steward? Very simply, stewards are managers. Deacon Davis, they manage another person's property. And as we look at the beginning of stewardship, the first thing I want to point out and share with you is that I want to show you an example of a good steward. An example of a good steward, we have to turn to Genesis chapter 39, verses 4 through 6, because one of the best examples of a steward is Joseph. Joseph is a, one of the best examples to show us how this stewardship thing really works. When you look at chapter 39, verses 4 through 6, Potiphar put Joseph in charge of his household. And he had trusted to his care everything he owned from the time he put him in charge of his household and all that he owned. So he left in Joseph's care everything he had with Joseph in charge. He did not concern himself with anything except for the food that he ate. Potiphar had entrusted everything in the hand of Joseph. Everything that he owned, he let Joseph manage. Everything that belonged to him, Joseph was allowed to manage. Potiphar entrusted it all to Joseph's care. And Joseph probably managed the fields. He oversaw the work crews. He made sure the house was repaired. He made sure there was food in the house. He seemingly even did the books because when you read a little further to verse number nine, it was clear that Joseph was in charge of everything except Sister Potiphar. 
And as a manager, Joseph was able to eat the finest foods. He was able to wear the best clothes. Stewards get to enjoy the things that they manage. They get to enjoy it, even though it doesn't belong to them, because they manage it, the owner allows them to enjoy what they manage. And so Joseph gives us a model of what it means to financially be a steward of God's things materially. We manage what we belong. We manage it, but it belongs to someone else. Stewards are much like bank tellers or uh, portfolio managers. They handle a lot of money but it's not theirs. They, they, get to, they get to manage it, they get to move it around, but it's not their money. And so stewards realize that everything I have, it belongs to the one who owns it. God owns everything and it all belongs to him. The money I get, God gives me the strength, he gives me the power, the creativity, the ability to obtain it, to make wealth. God does this for me. It's nothing that I ever do on my own. It is God who gives me the strength, the power, the ability, the creativity, the ingenuity, whatever it is. And however I get this money, it is God who has provided and God who has produced in me this way to get it. We didn't make ourselves so smart or so good. Amen. Amen. I know you think I know you think you did it all on your own. And this this is the problem. And this is the real problem when it comes to stewardship and releasing your material possessions to God, because the problem is you feel like you work so hard. You work so hard to earn what you have, and that's why you feel like it's really yours. I mean, you you went through the training. You went to the workshops. You put in the long hours. You went in early. You stayed late. You developed the program. You developed the plan. You came up with the business plan. And, and, and you think that everything you did is the reason it's successful. And so you're probably wondering, because I've done such a good job, how does this belong to God and not to me? And so when your paycheck comes, it's in your hand. And, and, and you don't go away feeling guilty because you feel like you did what? You earned it. I earned it. I deserve it. So, so we put up with a lot and, and we got the job done. right. I mean, I put up with cranky uh, bosses, supervisors. I put up with mean co-workers, uh, people who uh, were not carrying their load. So you feel like you earned it and you deserve it and it is yours. So it's a little hard to swallow the thought that it belongs to God. And so God knew that this self-righteous attitude uh, was going to happen. So he says, you may say to yourself in Deuteronomy chapter 8, my power and the strength of my hands have produced this wealth for me. But remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the ability to produce wealth. If we work on an assembly line, if you drive a school bus, if you cook at a fast food restaurant, if you teach at school, if you run a cooperation, if you write for a new newspaper, if you sing for the opera, if you own your own business or greet customers at Walmart, it is only possible because God has enabled you to do it. If I believe I'm the owner, I'm going to constantly be in conflict with God. Because I feel like I own it, so I'm going to always be in conflict with God. But the moment I realize I'm simply a manager and God is the owner, he has entrusted it to me as a steward. And he wants me to manage it in such a way that it brings glory and honor to him. Then I will no longer be in conflict with God, but I'll get to enjoy freedom and freedom will overtake my life. Because no longer do I think I'm the owner. And whenever you think you're the owner, and that's why at offering time, you hear guys, you know, they, they're trying to encourage you. I mean, they're going on and on. And, you know, they're going to Malachi. Bring ye all the tithe. Amen. Or give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And you know those verses. But the problem is you don't want to release it because you feel like it's yours. And you're the owner. 
And since you're, you feel like you're the owner, it's hard for you to give God what belongs to him. So Joseph is a real good example of a steward. But let me say a word about the faithfulness of a steward. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, it says, Now it is required that those who have been given a trust, that is, they are stewards, must prove to be faithful. Now the word steward here, the Greek word steward here, includes a form of the word house, and it describes a household manager. And in the ancient Greek world, uh, those who handled uh, the finances of an owner had to be found faithful. And managers are accountable to the owner. Amen. They have to give an account to the owner. Listen, there was a young couple uh, around August 2015. Uh, this young couple, uh, they, they were uh, joined in holy matrimony. And this young couple, uh, they were living in a house. They were living in a house and they decided when they pulled up, that the landscape was not to their liking. Uh, the landscape, it was overgrown. It looked like a jungle uh, in the front yard. And so what they decided to do was get this uh, faithful brother to come out and trim some trees and, and cut off some limbs so, you know, they could see the house. Uh, they could see the house, and then they could see their way down the sidewalk at night. Uh, so they had the landscape kind of uh, trimmed back. And then on the inside of the house, the house was real dingy looking. The walls were all dingy. And they decided, you know what, we're going to paint the walls. And they painted them different colors. And they had a color in this room and a color in that room. Well, when they moved out of the house, uh, they didn't get their deposit back. Because the problem was they were not owners of that house. They were renters. And because they were renting the house, the owner held them accountable because the owner is the one who planted the landscape. The owner liked the landscape. The owner liked the overgrown trees and the hedges and the bushes and the rainforest looking front yard. The owner liked the neutral, dingy looking walls in the house. And so when that young, beautiful couple painted the house and trimmed back the landscape, they did it because they thought they owned it. But it wasn't theirs to do that. So then they were being held accountable by the owner and he held their deposit because they were renting and not owning. And now the owner was very upset and holding them accountable for what they did to his property. And my brothers and sisters, one day God's going to hold us accountable for what we do with his property. He's going to hold us accountable for what we have done with the things that he has allowed us to borrow or manage. What did you do with that spouse? What did you do with those children? What did you do with that house, that car? What did you do with the money? What did you do with that time I gave you? What did you do with the gifts, the abilities, the talent that I gave you? One day we're going to have to answer to God for how we managed his property. He's going to hold us accountable. There, there's a seriousness, Dr. Allen, to having things. Amen. Having money, health, time, spouse, children. God is going to hold all of us accountable for how we manage his property because it all belongs to God. Now back to Joseph. Joseph became prime minister. You know the story. Joseph uh, was accused of uh, sexual harassment, uh, convicted of a rape he didn't commit. Uh, Sister Potiphar, she went after young Joseph, and Joseph didn't want her. He left his coat, and Joseph ends up in prison. Uh, and, but then later, Joseph is elevated. Pharaoh releases him from prison because Joseph helps him uh, with a dream that he had. And so Joseph ends up being second in command, and he was in charge of everything. Now, that's some mercy right there. Joseph was a faithful person because here's the thing. Joseph was in charge of everybody. That means he was in charge of Potiphar, Miss Potiphar. Boy, if Joseph was wicked, he could have got him back. 
But since Joseph was a faithful brother and the Lord was with him, Joseph became a, a, a steward on a greater level. God made it happen. Why? Because Joseph was a faithful steward. Even when Joseph was in prison, he was still a faithful steward. And he realized that everything belonged to God. And he knew that some way, somehow, God was still working in his life. Stewards manage the property of others, and stewards who are faithful receive greater privileges. Oh, yes, they do. Look at Luke chapter 16, verse 10. Listen to what the Lord says. Jesus says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will be dishonest with much. If you're not giving to the Lord now, it's no need of you saying, Lord, if you help me win the lotto, God, if you help me win, I'm going to give a large sum of money to the work of God. No, you're not. If you're not giving it to him now, you're not going to give it to him later. Because if you can't write the Lord a check... On a, right now, you, you're making about 800 a week, so 10% of that would be what? $80. Now, if you can't give God $80 off of that 800, do you think you're really going to be able to write a check off of 8 million? No, we might get that $80 check then. But scripture says, whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. What is Jesus talking about? Was he promising to make us richer financially if we're faithful stewards of our money? No. No, he isn't. Although I imagine that the apostle Paul was faithful with all of the money that was entrusted to him taking up offerings for churches and the relief of the saints. I, I, I guarantee you, Elsie, he was faithful, but he certainly wasn't wealthy. So if the promise of financial wealth is not what Jesus is teaching, what is Jesus teaching? He's teaching that God uses our stewardship financially to determine how much he can trust us with spiritually. I like the way Eugene Peterson puts it in the Message Bible. If you're a crook in small things, you'll be a crook in big things. If you're not honest in small jobs, who's going to put you in charge of the whole store? Jesus is saying that God is testing our financial stewardship to determine who he can trust, how, if he can trust us with spiritual and ministry privileges. God says, can I really trust you? Because our management of money, it affects the internal impact uh, of what we have. It, it affects, uh, you know, really, Scripture says, wherever your heart is, your treasure will be there also. Jesus never promised us worldly wealth here on earth. But if he does, cool. Just manage what you have. It's not about how much you have. But it's how you manage what you have. And God is grading us as we deal with our finance. God is grading. How much we have is not an indication of spirituality. How we manage what we have is an indication of our spirituality. Listen, you can be broke and be mean, evil, and wicked. You can have a whole lot of money and be mean, evil, and wicked. Just because you don't have a lot does not make you more spiritual. Amen. Because Job had a lot. Job had riches, but he had a relationship with God. He had loot, but he loved the Lord. Job knew how to manage what he had. That's why when Job lost it, Job said, blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord, he said, naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked I'm going to return. He said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. See, when you realize that you're a steward and not an owner, you realize that what you have, God gave it to you. 
that what you are, God, made you. And if you're going to get any more, it's going to be by the hand of God. It's what David says in First Chronicles chapter 29. David says, Lord, he says, I'm giving you all of this because my affection is toward the house of God. He says, but he says, who am I and who are my people that we can so freely and willingly give to you because it came from your hand? Everything I have, it came from him. The house I live in, it came from him. The car I drive, it came from him. The degree on the wall, it came from him. It was God who opened the door. I know you did the work. I know you took the exams. I know you wrote the papers. But had it not been for the Lord opening that door for you to go in the first place. If it had not been for God placing what he placed inside your brain. Everybody's not doing it on that level. Hear me. I wish y'all would hear me. And somebody say, thank God. That's why the songwriter says you ought to count your blessings one by one. In other words, you need to look over your life and take inventory and realize how the Lord has blessed you. Regardless of our level of income, it's a test. Stewardship testing starts early and it lasts throughout your life. A child is tested when they get an allowance, when they get a little birthday money, they're being tested. When that teenager gets that part time job, they're being tested. They're being tested. So my son, so my son is working uh, part time as a bellhop, and uh, my wife uh, says, "All right, where's your where's your tithe money?" You know, so she she reminds him, "Where's your tithe money?" And then so Caitlin is working. Say, "Hey, uh, you paying your tithes?" Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't worry, I'm gonna check. <laughs> so, but then. A few weeks later, Trey comes in and he brings his tithe. And so here's the thing about it. A lot of times people don't give when they become adults because they were never taught to give when they were a child. And they didn't see their parents give. And their parents didn't make it a priority to give to God. But like the guy in the video, they made their house a priority. They made car number one, two, and three a priority. They made their hobbies, their activities, they made all of that stuff a priority. They bought a boat, fishing rods, lures, bait. They have fishing license. But when it comes to their spirituality, they don't even own a Bible. You buy golf clubs, golf shoes, golf cart. And I, and I heard the sport is very expensive and addictive. It's what a friend told me. I said, I'm going to learn the game. He said, man, I'm going to tell you now, it's expensive and it's addictive. So the house, the car, the activities, the credit cards, and you get deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper into debt because you got this plastic money and you don't know how to manage it well. Now, if you know how to handle it, that's one thing. But uh, a lot of people don't. They go in the store and they, oh, okay, I got the credit. Let me just put my card out. I'm old school. I like cash. I like cash because when I touch my cash is in, and I give so much away, in a day at a store. I don't know what that number is, Anthony, but there's a number in my head that I know for that day, that's it. I will spend not another dime. I have reached my limit. You know why? Because it's in my hand. I feel it. But when I use that card, oh, here, take it, take it. So the credit card, and then the rest is consumed on yourself. 
and God gets nothing. And like the guy said in the video, he said, dude, he brought the pie. Guess what? What you have, he gave it. He brought it all to the party. How can he not get anything? The only reason you're eating the pie is because God brought the pie. The only reason I have it, God. And, and you know what? That video, I watched it last night, and I, I told my wife, I said, this is so true, and that's what people do. You know he's there. You know he's there. You know he brought it. You know he deserves it. But you want to ignore the fact that he's even involved. So God is looking for people he can trust with eternal things. And he knows how you handle your material stuff if he can trust you with true riches. So every financial decision, Sister Board, is a spiritual decision. So just examine yourself to see how faithful you've been as a steward. To begin with, we are stewards of material wealth. We have, whether much or little, we're one day going to have to answer to God for how we handle that wealth. How you acquired it and how you managed it. God's not going to just want to know, did you sing in the choir? Mm -mm. Because you can sing, you can preach, you can talk. That's why in scripture he says, you know what? You love me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. That's why you can teach Sunday school and not, and not give. That's why you can be a preacher and stand and not give. That's why you can sing in the choir and not give because you can do it with your lips all day long. But where's your heart? I love the Lord. That's why I'm singing. He didn't ask you to sing to him. He said, bring. But see, we want to give God what we want to give him and not what he has required of us, not what he's asked us. We want to give him You know, I don't, I don't do anything lemon. Nothing lemon except lemonade or lemon in my water. I don't like lemon candy, lemon cake, lemon cookies, lemon pie, lemon ice cream. I don't do it. And so I told this person that, and years ago, what did it bring me? They brought me, well, I make the best lemon cake, and once you taste my lemon cake, you are going to like my lemon cake because it don't taste all lemony. So I brought you a lemon cake. I like strawberry cake. I love banana pudding. But you want to bring me what you want to bring me. And just to show her I tasted it, and said, you can have your cake back. Because I still don't like lemon cake. And what do we want to do? Give God what we want to give him. We never want to give him what he asked for. He said, bring ye all the time. Honor God with your first fruits, not your crumbs, not your least, not your leftovers. But give God your very best. God didn't give us his leftovers. He gave us his best. He woke you up this morning with brand new mercy. He didn't give you yesterday's mercy. He met you this morning with brand new mercy. And in heaven, when it came to giving us uh, our salvation, he gave us heaven's best. He clothed himself in human flesh. Lastly, lest I hold you too long. I got four more points. No, seriously, this is the last one. The last, the last one. The mindset of a steward. Let me say something about the mindset of a steward. Christian stewardship goes beyond paying God a tenth of your income. Then using the remainder as we please. 
See, true stewardship means that we thank God for all we have. And then we use the rest as he directs. Giving God 10% of your income to begin is, is the beginning of financial stewardship. But you got to remember that God should control what you do with the remaining 90%. What does God want me to do with this paycheck? You know one thing I believe God wants you to do? Because Proverbs talks about that ant who stores up, looks ahead to the future. I believe God wants you to give your tithe, your 10% to the kingdom. Then I believe God wants you to be like that ant and take another 10% and store it in the credit union, the IRA. And then he wants you to take this other 80% and use it as he directs you. And the reason a lot of us can't do this 10% to God is because we don't do 10% to ourselves and we use this 100% and we blow it on everything else. And so now you are not in a position to freely give because you have nothing here and you've wasted all of this over here on stuff you don't need buying cars to impress people, houses to impress people, designer clothes to impress people. You know, people's like, man, where you get that suit? Man, did, I know you had that made the way it fits you. Yeah, I do look good in it, but no, I didn't have it made. I didn't have it made. I just, you know what? I don't go to DSW that often because I think really it's a, it's a prejudice store. It's a, it's a woman's store. Because there, there are three aisles for men's shoes, and there's 20 aisles of women's shoes. But when I do go, Didi, I go straight. I don't even look. I go straight to the back. And there's a section back there, and I don't start at the 10% off. I look for that tag. I think it's purple. And it's, 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 they got one with 70% off. That's the first tags I start looking for. Then I work my way back up. But I'm going to see what I can find in the clearance section first. I wish y'all were here, man. You got to learn how to be a wise steward. So what does God want me to do with this paycheck? That's the real question. Because the whole paycheck belongs to him. My budget is his budget. How does God want me to allocate what he has given me? How does God want me to use this house? How does he want me to use this extra money? How much should I invest? How much should I spend? How much should I give away? God, I need you to help me to know how to manage this. It's all his. How should I use it? Should I buy this car? Do I really need another car? <laughs> Should I buy this car? <laughs> All right, that's inside. Should I buy this car? <laughs> oh, I went to the dealership today. I had to take my car. I'm, 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 I'm rushing to a close. I had to take my car to get it service. They said, hey, we want to buy your car. I said, all right. He said, it's right a good time. Buy. We got to buy it for it right now. I said, all right, let's talk. You sit in that new car, you smell that smell. It's intoxicating. The car was clean. It had, it had rims on it. I mean, it was beautiful. He said, take it home. Take it home. Bring it. You can bring it back. You can bring it back Monday. Take it. Take it. This is a Friday. You can bring it back Monday, Reverend. No, no, can't do it, can't do it, can't. I said, let's go, we're going to work some numbers. I say, if you can make me feel like I just won the lotto with the deal you're going to give me, I said, we might be able to talk. 
He said, all right. He went and talked to his manager. Not really. You know, when they say that, they're really around the corner getting some coffee and talking. <laughs> <laughs> he ain't went to talk to nobody. You already know what you're going to say on this call. Yeah. And so then the manager comes in. He, well, you know, if I can do this, Reverend. I said, nope. That's not a lottery deal right there, brother. So he said, I'll be back. He's going to talk to the general manager. Yeah, okay. He went out to the service department and he came on back. But he, I said, no. He said, so if I did this, you wouldn't leave here in this car? And I thought about it. And I, I don't know if it was a wise decision or I made a mistake. Because I text my wife. <laughs> and I told her what I was about to do. And she said, if you bring that car home. <laughs> so I guess it was a wise decision. <laughs> There's going to be a problem. So do I really need this? What's wrong with the one that's paid for? Now, if you can afford it and you have the money and it's not going to hinder you from giving to God, building up uh, uh, resources for yourself for the future so you can continue to live in the future and, and you can still do the other stuff you need to do, then fine, do it. It's okay. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having things. Just don't let the things have you. The size of the pur purchase is not the issue. What matters is that it's all God's money, and I've got to decide how he wants me to use it. Stewards give willingly. God says, you can express how much you trust me by bringing he said, bring you all the tithes to the store. He said, I will open up the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you will not have room enough to receive. And only when you come to grips, Sister Willis, with the fact that we are stewards and not owners, can we give freely and willingly and joyfully. You know why you can give cheerfully? Because you know it belongs to God. God gave it to you. Man, I'm just able to manage it. Stewards give willingly and stewards can enjoy blessings. Paul said wealthy Christians should not put their hope in wealth which is so uncertain but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything. Catch this. He says for our enjoyment. It's not wrong to enjoy what God has allowed you to manage. It's, not, it's, it's, not, it's nothing wrong with you going on a cruise. It's nothing wrong with you staying in a suite. It's nothing wrong with you having things and material goods. It simply means that we give up the control. Think like stewards doesn't mean that we give up good things. I just give up my control over it. And a stewardship mindset doesn't mean that we don't enjoy good things. It actually means that we enjoy things more. Because real, real enjoyment and real joy comes from God and God alone. I don't care what, what, how, much, how much material stuff you have, it can never give you real enjoyment and true joy because that only comes from God. If we earn our money selfishly, we will spend it selfishly. And selfish people don't enjoy much. They complain the most. Whether they're digging ditches or living in a high-rise condo. Wealthy people who are selfish don't enjoy much. If you're not happy now, if you don't have joy with what you have now, a larger house is not going to give you joy. A luxury car is not going to give you joy. More shoes, more purses, more dresses, more clothes, more suits is not going to give you joy. If your joy is not in Jesus, nothing else is going to be able to give you that joy. 
All I've been trying to tell y'all is everything we have, he gave it. All we are, he made us. What we accomplish, he allows it. There used to be a song we used to sing when I was growing up at the Antioch Missionary Baptist Church on the Pastor Charles B. Kelly on Cottage Street, right there in Stop 6. The choir used to sing this song, X. They used to sing it, and it's so true that the Lord is blessing me right now. Oh, right now. He woke me up this morning and started me on my way. The Lord is blessing me right now. Oh, right now. He woke me up this morning. I was clothed in my right mind. He didn't let me sleep too late. He woke me up right on time. He woke me up this morning and started me on my way. The Lord is blessing me right now. Oh, right now. Is there anybody in here that knows that the Lord is blessing you? He blessed you yesterday, but he is blessing you right now now tell your neighbor I'm a blessed person I'm a blessed person everything I have he gave it what I am he made me what I've been able to accomplish to achieve it's only because God has given me the strength the ability it is because God has given me what I need to do what I need to do and it all belongs to him that's why Paul says whatsoever you do whether you eat whether you drink do it all to the glory of God I'm gonna help you out whether you eat whether you drink whether you shop whether you travel whatever you do do it all unto the glory of of God give in such a way that you're saying God I know it belongs to you I realize and recognize it's yours and if I'm going to get any more it's going to come by your your hand don't be like the little boys who used to come to my office and they reach into my candy bowl I saw these boys not too long ago. They're both grown men now. But they little boys. They used to come in, get hands full. Handful. Whose candy was it? Mine. But I freely gave to them every time they came in. And so one day I saw them uh, on a Wednesday. And they went in the hallway. And uh, one of them had some Skittles. And, and, and I said, let me have some. He pulled back. And these were little boys. He grabbed, pulled back. I said, man, you're not, you always eat my candy. You're not going. And he squeezed the bag real hard. And it popped. And Skittles went everywhere. And tears in his eyes. I helped him clean up the mess he made. And then I went in my office and guess what I had in my office? Some Skittles. And I gave him a bag of Skittles. In the first place, you were being blessed with my candy because I gave it to you. Then you didn't want to give to me and you lost it. But the only way you were able to get some more Skittles is because I decided to reach into my stash, my storehouse, and bless you with some more. Stop. See, they, that was a little boy. When I was a child, I thought as a child. I behaved as a child. But when I became a man, a grown-up, an adult, I put away childish things. God, I we thank you, we praise you. God, thank you now for every good and perfect gift. Father, thank you for your goodness, your grace, your generosity. Father, we thank you for everything that you've given us came by your hand and we're so appreciative for how you have blessed us God you've blessed us with houses God you've blessed us 
with clothing and shelter. You've entrusted us with gifts, talents, abilities that we can use in such a way to bring glory and honor to your name. And Father, we say thank you. God, forgive us for being selfish. Forgive us for giving you our leftovers. We pray now, God, this day that you would help us to be better stewards and realize we're not owners, but we're simply managers. And one day we're going to have to give an account of how we manage your property. So God, help us now to be the steward that will one day hear you say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Help us not to be found like that wicked servant who was hiding the master's property and treasure and not using it for him. Help us to be faithful. That when we're faithful of a little, you know you can trust us with much. And God, we say thank you. For everything you've given, we bless your name. Most of all, God, we thank you that you gave us heaven's best, your son, Jesus Christ. God, who died on Calvary, who paid the price, the penalty for our sins. God, we thank you. God, we thank you for the blood that was shed. We thank you for his body that was bruised. And now, God, we can say thank you that we're now a part of the family of faith. Because he died that Friday and you raised him up early Sunday morning with all power. And God, we say thank you. And we bless your name. And so God, this day forward, God, we want to give you our best. Because you gave us your best. And because we love you. And we say thank you. And it's in Jesus' mighty and marvelous name that we pray and ask it all. Amen. Come on, give God glory. Give God glory. Give God glory. Come on, brothers. Give God glory. Give God glory. As we prepare our hearts for uh, communion and to give unto the Lord. To give unto the Lord. Amen. To give unto the Lord. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. If you need an envelope, raise your hand. Raise your hand. The ushers will assist you if you need envelope raise your hand the ushers will will assist you you know what we've asked for church anniversary a $200 sacrificial offering so we can continue to do those things that we shared what we're doing in our children's area and um, I know February has passed but you can still uh, give to that as we continue to do things for the kingdom of God. Uh, I'm not going to say uh, you have an envelope. You, you can read. You know what's on there. Uh, most of you have already filled them out. Amen. As we prepare to get ready to give. Uh, who's ever doing uh, communion is coming at this time to read our scripture. And, uh, uh, and prayer. And then we're going to... Uh, share in the Lord's Supper. Amen. My brothers and sisters, as we prepare our hearts and our souls uh, for the giving this offering, let us all stand. Let us all stand and hold our tithes, our seeds up. And we're going to do the vision statement at this time. Amen. Let us say it together. We are building a ministry.